what am I doing here? As you've read or heard, I did spend some time in the church, and then I wound up uh, wearing a yarmulke, and it's been a whole confusing mess, so I thought I would come to South Africa and straighten it all out. When I was just a little kid, uh, I started out in the reform movement. I grew up in a little town called Ventura, California. It's a little beach, sleepy beach town. Uh, there were, uh, by the time I got to high school, there were, 10, uh, there, were, there were seven Jews in a class of about 2,500 students. And none of those Jews were religious. We were all what we called reform. Back in those days, reform was not um, as spiritual as it, I think it's becoming more spiritual. I have a couple of uh, nieces and nephews who are going through the same temple I went to, and it's, it seems to be better. They seem to be identifying Jewishly. When I was a kid, it wasn't that way. Uh, you know, by the time I was born, it wasn't that much after uh, they had started to talk about the Holocaust. So they decided to show movies um, uh, about the Holocaust to little kids, but they were testing it out on us. And what we had in the synagogue, at the Reform Synagogue, is we had the Holocaust movies, we had the paintings of Marc Chagall, and we had planting trees in Israel. Do you remember those little cards you put the quarters in, and they killed a million trees to print the cards? <laughs> so... Go figure. So that's, that was the holy trinity of Reform Judaism when I was growing up. And it wasn't enough to keep a kid feeling safe because it wasn't a safe time. We were in the middle of the Cold War. You guys remember the Cold War? There were missiles pointed. Uh, I was, my understanding was that they were all pointed at my house. And I was nervous about that. And we did these duck and cover drills. They would say, they would say uh, when you hear the buzzer, stick your head under the desk and your bum in the air. And then if the nuclear bomb falls anywhere in the room, but it doesn't land on your desk, you're OK. Because that for Micah, it's something, right? And that made you feel better. So then also they had discovered um, black holes. The scientists, excuse me a second, I'm, I'm not a magician, so I have to. Thank you. I was just calling my accountant, but I appreciate the I'm in. <laughs> Very religious crowd. Um, <laughs> I have a friend, when you, if, you, if, he, if he asks you how you are and you say, ah, oh, Baruch Hashem, he says, I didn't ask if you were religious. I asked how you are. <laughs> so they discovered these black holes, and they didn't, uh, it was like a super uh, gravitational force that would, it was, like the, it was like the England of outer space, right? It would suck the color off of you. It would suck, and... They, were, they could take planets into them, and the problem was they didn't tell us where they were. So I thought there was one in my hall on the way to the bathroom, on the way to the loo. So I would get up in the morning, as a, as a little kid, five in the morning, it's dark, and I would go down the hall terrified that I was going to get sucked into the black hole. So I'd put my hand out, and ho I'd hold on to the, hang on to the, the, the closet door, and I'd go slowly in case it should suck my hand in. Maybe I could get out and escape the black hole. The point is, it made me nervous. Between the Holocaust movies, the black holes, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Cold War, I was a nervous kid. I, and I began to wonder, like, why are we here? I, was, I had a fear of mortality at a very young age. I used to ask my Sunday school teacher at Temple Beth Torah, I wanted to know what was on the other side of infinity. And she was very impressed. I was in second grade asking about infinity. And I ran into her, years later, I was working at the grocery store, and she came in, I was 18, and she said, David, you are such a good student. You used to ask the most interesting questions about infinity. How are you doing with all that? And I said, not much better, thank you. <laughs> I discovered, though, during that time, while I was feeling anxious, I would, that if I put on a show, or I told a joke, or I entertained my friends, I felt great. I felt alive, and the fear of mortality was pushed away. It wasn't gone, but it was pushed away. And so I would do that. I was the class clown. I would be in the talent show. I would write skits and plays. I would do the Purim spiels. Um, and, and what I found was I would make a connection with the audience. It's hard here because you guys are so far away, but we can see each other, right? We're looking, and we're having a moment. We're connecting. And in this vast world where it doesn't last forever, and I'd realized very quickly they were teaching us math, right? How long do we live? At the time, I think the average was about 80 years. Okay, 80 years, that's about 800,000 hours. 800,000 hours, and you sleep for about 200,000 hours. Some of you sleep more. You're in the bathroom for 25,000 hours, except women are there for 50,000 hours. <laughs> and you eat for another 25 or 30,000 hours, and most of us have lived about uh, 200, 300, 400,000 hours. You people have about 70,000 hours left. What are you doing here? That terrified me. So you've got infinity, 
And what happens to any number? This is what we learned in math. Any number next to infinity, where does it go? It goes to zero, right? Infinity plus 5,000 is infinity. Infinity minus 800,000 is infinity. It goes to zero. Normal numbers next to infinity go to zero. And that's how I felt. I felt like a zero. So I thought, I'm putting on a show, feels good. How many people do I need in my audience? This is fantastic. God bless the chief. You know? <laughs> Hail to the chief, as we say in the States. There's like, there's like 400 people in here. I don't need 400. 400 is good. I can go with eight. We can do with 20. What's the number you have to have for an audience? You need one. One person. One person. We can connect for just a moment. For a moment. We're on this planet that's only going to last for 80 years for us. But we connect for just a moment. Here we are. We're having a moment. And in that moment, I felt great. So I jumped back and forth. By the way, can you hear me okay when I'm like this? Or is it better like this? Better like this. Okay, then. So... I would jump back and forth from being afraid of mortality to putting on a show and feeling great. And if you jump back and forth fast enough, it looks like you're sane and you're walking down the middle. I maybe should have been on some kind of a medication. <laughs> half of our country, I don't know how it is here, but half of our country is on some sort of antidepressant in the US. If it's the same here, then which half of this room is paying for their smile? <laughs> Let's see here. So I kept putting on a show. By the time I was in high school, um, I had done all the shows that I could do. Friends of mine, we'd sit in the quad at lunchtime dressed in black and be artsy and revolutionary. And, and I one day said to them, you guys, I got to tell you, given all the pain and the anxiety and the worry in the world, measured against the joy and the uncertainty, I, th I really think it would be better not to be here. I'm just saying. And they said, no. None of them said that because they were all Gentiles. But they said, so go ahead, jump off the roof. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid of that. And remarkably, I said, I don't know everything yet. But I'm just saying, it seems like a lot of trouble for the 80 years to become a zero. And um, so at Christmas time, with these questions in my mind, and having been a Reformed Jew and feeling like I knew all there was about Judaism, I went to work at the bakery because I was the Jew who could work on Christmas and Easter and the Super Bowl. And I would work at the bakery, and at the end of the day, they gave me all the pies to take to my friends. And I went around and delivered them all to my friends on Christmas Eve, and I stopped at the, my best friend's house th on that evening, and he had his uh, brother-in-law waiting for me, a youth minister. And these guys had been working on me. I, I was always going to church and visiting, but I was always making fun of Christians because I was a smart aleck. And so I like to tease my friends, you know, how can three be one? That makes no sense. I'm three, I'm one, I'm three, I'm three and one. I'm a breath, I'm a breath mint. And, oh, oh, look, I died and I rose again. What a sacrifice. I would sign up for that. He's dead, he's alive, hey! It's like a magic trick. I didn't get it. I liked mocking them, and they, they didn't like that. But this youth minister was pretty clever. And he quickly realized that he wasn't going to be able to get me to believe in the Son of God because I didn't believe this Son had a Father. I didn't believe in God. I wanted to believe in God. I thought it was a nifty idea. And I would like to believe in it because with God comes, I'm told, eternity. And that's what he said. He said, look, he, he, he said, forget about, forget about the Son. Let's just talk about God for a minute. Could there be a God? And, and he basically, he won me over to the notion that there could be one. And here's how he did it. He mentioned, basically, the universe. He said, look at the world. Let's take, for instance, and I'll, I augment a bit because I'm a smart aleck and I'm a storyteller, but he basically talked about babies and creation. Let's take the baby. The first baby was born 10 gazillion years later, uh, a year, years ago. I'm not an anthropologist, so you'll forgive my dates. But he was born, and as we all know, the first baby was born with a freakish set of little incisors. <laughs> And the baby was being brought up to the mother's bosom, and it's going to be beautiful love. And as it's coming closer, the mother's looking at the teeth. And she's looking at her bosom, and she's thinking, this isn't going to work out very well. And he's coming closer, and it's like a horror movie. And he comes up, and he gloms on. And she screams, and she hurls the baby across the cave. And he smashes against the wall, and there's baby and blood and bits and skull, and it's a tragedy. I'm sorry to offend. This is science. 
And on the cave, the blood smears into the shape of what looks like a man hunting an antelope. And years later, they find it and they think, art. <laughs> Some babies die for their art. And, and we have to wait 10 gazillion years later for a freakish baby to be born, as we know, with no teeth. A mutant child. <laughs> Mama. Mama. And the mother looks at the child, and the child looks at the mother, and it's pure love. And up comes the baby to the mother's bosom, and he launches on <laughs> lunch. And the baby is happy, and the mother is happy, and they're nursing, and they're rocking, and it's great. And then the baby turns two, and they throw it a steak. And the baby is trying to eat the steak. <laughs> It's a disaster, and in comes a saber-toothed tiger, and the tribe runs away, and the baby is still there gnawing on a steak, and there's tiger and baby and blood and skull and man on the wall, and it's a disaster. And we've got to wait 10 gazillion years later for another baby to be born. Of course, he's born with a beautiful set of no teeth, a remarkably gross teeth when he's two. They just come in, bing. Bing, 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 little baby teeth. Mm, yum, 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 yum. They toss him a steak. He's eating the steak. And it's just fabulous. It's baby. It's steak. It's happy. He turns 13. It's time for his bar mitzvah. And of course, a twofer, you get married that same night in the cave. They line up the women over here, the young girls. And of course, the baby with the teeth. He's got this big 13-year-old head and a whisker and all these little tiny baby teeth. And the women look across at this freakish kid with the big head and the tiny teeth, and they go, I'm not dancing with him. Are you going to dance with him? I'm not dancing with him. Let's get out of here. And the kid dies alone, as so many of us fear we will. And we've got to wait 10 gazillion years later for another baby to be born who has no teeth. Of course, he grows the teeth when he's two, and then they fall out. But not all at once, God forbid. We're back to the toothless baby. No, they fall out one at a time to be replaced by teeth that are slightly larger. And they grow in, and then come the molars, and then the wisdom teeth. And it all works out perfectly, and we know that after 10 gazillion years, you're standing before you as a baby with a perfectly beautiful set of teeth, and it's all just an accident. It's just an accident. You take some carbon-based compounds, you shake them up, you put them in the oven for 400 degrees for 60,000 gazillion years, and you get babies, and you get spiders, and you get kidneys that do perfect filtration, and you get blood that runs through the same tube. Sewage, oxygen, protein, vitamins, antibodies, goes right to the right place, comes back out. Spiders, don't get me started. There's a trillion different systems here on the planet, and it's all just an accident. And at the end of the evening, had he convinced me that there was a God? No, but he did something beautiful. He made it plausible. He made it not stupid to believe in a God. And so that night, out of gratitude, because what came with God, he said, was a soul. And I later learned to call that an ashama, but he called it a soul, and he said that it was eternal, and aha, a jump to eternity. And then there was an afterlife. I had no idea that the Jews had invented that, he took all the credit. He said that that was the Father and the Son invented this afterlife thing, and you couldn't get in without the Son. It's good business. It's good father-son business. It's a good, it's, that's, that's a Jewish plan. You can see what they're up to there, you know. You pass it on. You keep it in the family. So that night I got on my knees, and I prayed the little prayer, and for no extra charge, they threw in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and instead of steak knives. And I was a Christian. And off I went. It was awkward for me the first year being a Christian because my Jewish friends weren't happy about it. And, uh, I, and, and my, I'd get these phone calls. Uh, I, we hear you're a Christian now. And I said, no, no, who told you that? Uh, uh, I'm not a Christian. And then I'd get a call from my Christians, and the Christian friends would say, we, we hear you're not a Christian. And I was afraid because I didn't know where I belonged. And, and I would say, no, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Who told you I wasn't a Christian? Peter Carlsberg said you weren't a Christian. Well, you know those Jews. <laughs> and it went like that back and forth, again with the back and forth, for about a year. And then I went to a camp called College Briefing. And it was a special Christian camp where they had these amazing, it was a little bit like this conference, a little smaller, not much smaller. The Christians do things big. And they called it College Briefing. They brought in these amazing theologians who taught us about kind of the deep thinkers of Christianity. And there were some deep thinkers. We learned about Helmut Thielicke and Soren Kierkegaard and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Bonhoeffer, who lost his life in the Holocaust fighting to save Jews and fighting to kill Hitler, um, gave up his life as a, as a uh, Protestant minister in the, in the camps. And that triggered my little Jewish brain. Now I had eternity, and I had God, and I had my brain going. And that 
th I was in. Sign me up. And I immediately got involved in the youth ministry at the church and uh, started doing my love of show business in the church. I was doing the skits and the plays and the slideshows for the church. We would get the kids all excited with the music videos, and then the pastor would come up and give the message, and the kids would all come up and get on their knees, and I was an evangelist. I started dating a beautiful little Christian girl, and we dated for quite a while, and one day she went home and asked her mother about our getting married. That was a surprise to both of us. <laughs> and her mother being a very smart mother and a wonderful person, said, you know, Katie, David has always had this love of show business, but he's never really gone for it. All this church stuff is cute, but he, he loves this stuff. You should make him move to Hollywood and make him spend a year there. And if he loves it, you have to ask yourself if you want to be a wife in Hollywood. If he doesn't like it and he comes back, he's a failure and he'll be all yours. And Katie came back and told me that, and I was blown away. And eight days later, I moved to L.A., and I, I enrolled in film school at USC. It's a very hard school to get into, so when, when I got accepted to that film school, I said, this is the word of God. They, they, it was, it's harder to get into the USC film school than it is to get into Harvard Law, and um, especially if you don't apply. I never applied to Harvard Law. Um, so... To get into the film school, what they wanted was people with a point of view. They didn't want people who, I just want to make movies, I always wanted to make movies. So I wrote in my statement, this world is a difficult world and a challenging world. JC offers comfort and hope to, this, to the people of this world. Film is the new most powerful medium by which to spread that message. Your film school is the most powerful school to teach that course. Please let me into your film school so that I can share the gospel with the world through film. And they basically, because they had, they wanted people with a point of view. That was a point of view. They had uh, communist filmmakers. They had ex-Vietnam vets. They had ex-priests, current priests. They had nuns, lesbians. I think they had a lesbian Vietnam priest um, <laughs> who was a communist. And, and they thought, why not have this crazy born-again Jewish evangelist? And I got in. I made a film there called The Man Who Loved Fat Dancing, which was a Christian comedy action film. It was sort of like a cross between Bruce Almighty and Ghostbusters. It had monsters in it that were demons and souls and dancing, and it was a crazy movie, a lot of fun. And that film got me an agent. And it was screened at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Science Theater, the Samuel Goldwyn Theater. And it was introduced that night. They showed four or five dramatic films, the best of the season. And my film was saved for last as sort of the cleanup because it was considered to be a really good film. And the introducer that night, our host, was uh, Sidney Pollack, the late Sidney Pollack. He's a soul heaven Aaliyah, a wonderful director, one of my heroes as, a, as an artist. And he stood up next to these two giant golden uh, Oscars, or Vodazors, as the rabbis call them, and, and, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the filmmaker David Weiss, and I stood up in my tux, and 1,200 people at the Academy applauded for my movie, and I was putting on a show, and it was intoxicating, and it was exciting, and I was thrilled, and shortly thereafter, I got an offer to do a, um, a to write a script for a Mormon, because he liked my little Christian film, and I didn't want to write Mormon stuff, so we came up with a kind of a Judeo-Mormon Christian action comedy adventure script, and uh, nobody wanted to make that movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he sent it to his Mormon friend, Don Bluth, who was living in Ireland, who was making a little film called, um, he was working on The Land Before Time, which was a dinosaur movie. He had done American Tale, little Fifel Mouskowitz, and, um, and now they were working on a third movie that was, they didn't know what it was going to be called yet, and they needed a writer because the writer they were working with, it wasn't working out. And I get this phone call, can you come to Ireland tomorrow and, and work on this film for two weeks? And I'm like, uh, tomorrow, that's Saturday. I can't fly on Saturday because, as we all know, the post, the post office where you get your passport is closed on Saturday, and I, can't, I don't have a passport. So I waited until Monday morning, 8 o'clock, got my passport, jumped on the plane, went to Ireland, ended up staying for two years, and the film that we made, that, the first film we made there was called All Dogs Go to Heaven. It was my first film. And I immediately went to the local church and said, hey, I'm a, I'm a lay leader. I'm a youth minister. Do you guys need a youth worker? And they said, yes, because we don't have one. And I began doing the youth leadership at Adelaide Road Presbyterian Church, right around the corner from, from McKenney's pub where you could get a great glass of Guinness, let me tell you now. 
And uh, I was the youth director there for about a year and a half. Uh, I started about six months in. And we had a wonderful time. I started teaching a class there in the Old Testament because I loved the Old Testament because it, it reminded me of home and childhood because I'd learned some stories. I knew some stories. We got to the Jewish festivals, and I couldn't make heads or tails of them. I mean, they had like a cow and a bull and six goats and a ram, and you put your right foot in, you put your left foot in. You put... It was the hokey pokey. I could not tell you what any of these things meant. And um, so I noticed there was a guy in the studio wearing the, as my writing partner calls it, the comedy hat. And, and he was orthodox. And so I stayed away from him for the first year. And he stayed away from me because he was afraid that I was a Jew for Jesus. Now, I was not a Jew for Jesus. Those guys never made any sense to me. I was a Christian. I wanted to be a Christian or be Jewish, but this business of mixing them together, Jews for Jesus makes about as much sense as lesbians for Chippendales. It's like, <laughs> where, you know, where are you going with this, you know? So, but now I needed the guy. And I said, would you come and teach a class about these Jewish festivals? He said, I won't come into the church. But if you'd like, I'll come into a home and I can tell you what we do. He taught two nights, Wednesday nights, the most amazing classes on the Jewish festivals, things I had never heard as a Jew. And I was amazed. And I, I pulled him aside afterwards. I said, look, David, I don't want to cause you any trouble. I don't want to convert you. I respect what you're doing. Your discipline is amazing. Your, your uh, ritual is beautiful. It's a very rich tradition. But let's face the facts. I have JC. He died for my sins. I have forgiveness once and for all. I'm going to heaven. Your temple is gone. Your sacrificial system is over. You're, you're, you're exiled from the land. How do you get salvation? How do you get close to God? And he said, well, I'll tell you. And he proceeded to explain Jewish theology to me. And I learned things that I had never learned as a, as a Jewish kid. Little things like, did you realize that there was no temple between the first temple and the second temple? Like 70 years, and you don't see the Jews running around going, where's Jesus? We need Jesus. And before the first temple, there was no temple for thousands of years. You don't see Moses up on the mountain going, I need some help carrying these tablets down the hill. Paging Jesus on Mount Sinai, please Jesus come. See the man with the tablets on row seven. It just didn't happen. No, the Jews were just having a conversation with their creator. And I went, wow, that's right. That is in there, isn't it? There's no mention of needing... Ow. And it caused me a problem because by that time I had spent about 12 or 13 years of my life fully dedicated to the church. I'd been all over the world with evangelists doing media and attending conferences. And it was my life. It had actually helped me with this whole balance thing. And now he was saying that maybe it wasn't really quite right for a Jewish kid to be in the church. And he clearly did not need my Savior. His life was balanced. It made sense. And he didn't have to apologize for his theology. I started finding little pieces of holes in the church. So I moved back to the States when I was done in Dublin. I changed churches so they wouldn't expect me to be in the youth leadership. And I started attending a different church and sat further back. Not so far back that I fell off the stage, but, but further back. And about that time, in walks a very lovely, tall, blonde woman. And I've, but this time, Katie's given up on me. This is five years later, and I'd moved to Ireland and disappeared. And um, I asked this young lady out. And she agrees to go out with me to my amazement. And we start dating. About that same time, I go to a film festival where I'm on the board of uh, advisors, and I meet a guy by the name of Michael Medved. Now, Michael Medved is a famous U.S. Um, film critic and radio commentator, conservative guy, so conservative that the Christians are always quoting him in magazines. So that's how I knew about him. So when I met him, I was shocked to see him wearing the, the kippah. And I thought, ah, maybe he's a lesbian for Chippendales. And he said, no, 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 I'm not a Jew for Jesus. I'm just a Jew. Why don't you come sometime for Shabbos? And that's what he said. He said, Shabbos. Shabbos. Now, I had never heard of Shabbos. I had heard of Shabbat and the Sabbath, but Shabbos was completely new to me. It was apparently the day of rest on which your lips went to sleep. And he would spit all over. Shabbos. It was dangerous to be around people who celebrated Shabbos without a raincoat. So I went to his house, and he had a table much like the tables I've been visiting here in South Africa. Tables with stunningly beautiful children. The porters have these uh, five that sit at the table and one that roams around on somebody's hip. And 
gorgeous, beautiful children with a sparkling gleam in their eye, no look of a fear of eternity or mortality in these eyes. Singing and playing, and, and at Michael's table they were singing in Hebrew and they were conversing with the adults and they were respectful and they were full of happiness. And I thought that's what I had wanted as a kid. That would have been great. And interestingly, about that time, I was making a movie for the church about um, trying to help kids stay out of trouble. And it's, you know, trying to teach kids how to stay out of trouble with a video is like trying to save the, the uh, Titanic with an ice pick. It's really hard. And, um, but we were making these movies, and I noticed they did a survey about this time. They said, what was the number one factor that would influence the success of a kid in future generations? And I think I've heard Dr. Pelkowitz mention this in his lectures since then, but I heard this at, in a church. And they said the number one factor wasn't whether their parents stayed married or whether they had an affluent education or whether they uh, came from a better part of town. It was the number of meals shared together around a table with another adult. Interesting, here were these Jews living around the table. They were having what looked like Christmas dinner to me. And I said, you must do this, what, once a year? That's five and 10. You made it look five, like I had 50 minutes left. That's awesome. Okay, that's 15 more minutes, okay, great. So they were having their, um, their, their and they said, no, we do this every week. And I said, that must be exhausting. But it was so beautiful, and so I became depressed. Why? Because when you see something really beautiful that you want, I mean, these parents were, what did they say? They had a Yiddish term for it. I think what they said was they were shepping nachos. But I thought they were schlepping nachos. And I love nachos. So I was like, yeah, nachos. But the, it was just gorgeous. And I wanted it, but it was too far away because I'm not orthodox. And I couldn't be orthodox. I can't give up driving on Saturday. Saturday is like my favorite day to drive, right? It's the best driving day, Saturday. And lobster, don't get me started. More importantly, I worked in Hollywood. And in Hollywood, they were working seven days a week, you know? And some of these guys, a few of them, were coked up out of their minds. <laughs> and I'm going to keep up with these guys by going, yeah, I don't come in on Friday nights or Saturdays. Yeah, I just chill. Are you crazy? I, I could buy a bicycle, move to China in a robe and Chairman Mao's books and become a Chinaman easier than I be become Orthodox. So I was depressed. It was so beautiful, but it was so far away. But I kept coming back. And they said, oh, come to shul. So I came to shul. They said, come at 10.30. They're putting the Torah away. And then the rabbi speaks. Oh, this isn't so bad. I didn't know they started at 8. It's a trick. So my new girlfriend says, where are you going on Saturdays? You keep kind of sneaking away on Saturdays. I said, well, I'm going to shul. What? Shul. What's that? Shul. It rhymes with cool, but it's not. She goes, well, I want to come. I said, you're not going to like it. She said, right. I said, there's, there's, there's people, there. there's women with hair, and there are men with hats, and there's a, there was a guy there with a strimal. You guys seen the strimal? Like the furry thing? I tried one of those. I thought, I'll try the strimal. Someone left the door open, and it got out. <laughs> and those things have no natural predator. It, it found a little poodle, and my strimal mixed with the poodle, and they made little strudels. That, okay, that didn't happen. I apologize. That never occurred. But more importantly, they had this fence, this huge, the great wall of decorum. I said, she's not going to fit in. She's a tall, Swedish-looking woman that's not very Jewish. She comes. She sits. She loves it. She loves it partially because I'm not sitting next to her, squeezing her hand, going, oh, isn't that lovely what the pastor said? Oh, I love this hymn. Listen to the harmony. No, it was just her and God praying and being together with other women who were strong and confident, and she loved it. So we kept going back. And then the rabbi would open his mouth and say amazing things. They would say things like, I, think I, just, I, I knew the Shema. I remembered the Shema. They said, the Shema. The Shema, it says on the Shema, and you shall, these words that I've taught you this day, you shall teach them to your children, and you shall place them upon your heart. Why does it say upon your heart? Why doesn't it say in your heart? And I'm thinking, in, on, who cares? It's close to your heart somewhere. No, 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 the Kutzker Rebbe, the Kutzker, I'm Kutzker the Rebbe man, I'm Kutzker the Rebbe can. I, who's the Kutzker? It sounds like Popeye's cousin. <laughs> and so the Kutzker says, no, no, there's a difference. There's a difference between in and on. These rabbis have all the time in the world to figure out the difference between in and on, but there's no time to shave, right? <laughs> so, but there's an important difference, an important difference. You can't put it in your heart because our hearts are like stone. And we know this. Our heart is like stone. 
the best we can do, it opens up once in a blue moon, in a vulnerable moment. Maybe we let somebody in. We know this. We talked about that. That we, we're desperately looking for that connection, right? We spend all of our lives looking for that one person that we can connect with. If we find them, we spend the rest of our lives making them crazy. But if we stack words on our heart that are important, words of, of honesty, how to treat your neighbor, how to treat your children, how to treat your spouse, how to take care of the environment, how to love one another, how to do good things, how to be straight and true in business. If you put all that stuff up on your heart, then in a rare moment of ecstasy, your heart will break open and the words will fall in. And I loved hearing this stuff because it resonated. I knew that my heart was hard. And I knew that it was hard to put stuff in there. And I'd been to a concert where I had a moment of ecstasy. Hey, da do, not the drug, not the drug. Do, de do, great concert, and my heart opens up, and what goes in there? Lady Gaga and Desperate Housewives? Ra, ra, ooh, ra, ra. That's not going to change your life very much. So we kept coming back. And we're slowly putting the, the, the teachings of Judaism into our Christianity. And the church people love it. We have a Seder at one point with Trafe Chinese food. And we had a little tape with a symphony orchestra doing the benching. It was great fun. We had the three matzahs for the father, son, and who's what. And, and all the little holes in the matzah for the holes. In the, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing that goes on when you start mixing these things up. There's a reason to keep them separated. And we slowly started to realize that the, well, we, first we got married. We got married before we got too smart. And so we were married in the church in front of a huge neon cross with the kippah and a chuppah and a Jewish for Jesus rabbi because he was the only one that would do it with the Presbyterian minister. And it was very confusing for everyone. My, my father was just, what is happening to my son? But bless his heart, he was there. He's a good sport. So... So, but shortly after getting married, we're like going to church on, we're going to shul all day Saturday, and we're going to, to church all day Sunday, and it's like, when do you go to the beach? Like, when do you go shopping? When do you go get your, you know, those big five-gallon drums of Doritos? So, we slowly started not going to church and going more to hear these great rabbis tell these great stories, and, and it was just kind of filling up our soul, and eventually my wife said, you know, I, wanted, I want to take this class. They have a class for introduction to Judaism up at the University of Judaism. So we took the class, and it was a great class. And about this time, uh, she, she says to me, I, I want to make the kitchen kosher. And she says, I also, I don't want to do this conversion with the reform, because I want, if our, if our kids ever go to Israel, I want them to really be able to go to Israel with ever, never being questioned. So she enrolls in an, in an orthodox conversion program. And I'm kind of panicking a little bit, but okay, this is good. I like the learning. And then she says, we're going to make the kitchen kosher. I come home from looking for a job one day. I'd forgotten about this. And there's a Chabad rabbi in my, in my driveway with all of my kitchen utensils and a blowtorch from World War II. And it's just... <laughs> he says, David, I'm sorry, but I can't make this one kosher. And I said, no, because you've melted it into the driveway. <laughs> but now the kitchen's kosher, and I feel guilty. We go out to breakfast, and we're having the, 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 my favorite breakfast is bacon and eggs. And we're having it at my favorite diner. And I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at my beautiful bride. Um, another time, maybe in the, other, the next session, we'll try and do the story about how you listened to your wife, got worked its way into Shrek. But, but I had learned some lessons from Rabbi Orlewick um, about the importance of, of, of what's important to your wife needs to be important to you. And she just made my kitchen kosher. And, and I'm thinking, I'm eating these bacon and eggs. I'm taking me into her kitchen. So, you know, I can't have the bacon anymore. And she says, good for you. And then a couple weeks later, we're there, and I'm looking at my eggs, and I know that they were cooked in the bacon. And I say, I can't have these eggs anymore. And she says, good for you. This is the blonde Swedish woman who had weeks earlier said, honey, the kitchen is kosher now. Please don't trafe it up. <laughs> I didn't know what trafing it up was. I had to ask a Swedish woman what trafe was. I was trafe. So, so then months later, we're at Johnny Rockets having cheeseburgers. And we both looked at each other and we said, we, we can't have these. And we said, check. And that was the end of meat and cheese eating out. Well, we go through a tough time at work. I'm having a hard time getting a job. And uh, the rabbi says to me, you're out of work. I was, yeah, I think I've messed up my life. We, we're having a hard time having children. I'm not working. All my Christian contacts have fled. And, you know, things aren't as good as they were. I'm thinking, maybe I made a mistake marrying this way and doing this orthodox life. And he says, no, we don't look back as Jews. We look forward. You're out of work. You have your mornings free. Yeah. <laughs> a 
Come to Binion. I said, you guys do this during the week? This is crazy. He says, yeah. So I show up at 6.30 in the morning, and there's all these guys wearing the little GPS boxes, right? So God will always know where they are. So I put on the box. Now, I'm not a huge believer in cause and effect. I don't think that you put on a fill-in and pray, and then you get what you want. It doesn't work that way. We, I know people who have prayed, and, you know, and then they get hit by a bus. And we call these people idiots for praying in front of a bus. But... <laughs> Thin the herd, I say. Thin the herd. But sure enough, slowly thereafter, I got the Rugrats job, and, and, and that helped our career. And then we get this call. My writing partner and I, we want to get on a primetime television show. That's sort of the holy grail of TV writing before our film career had really taken off. And there's this show, Sybil, which in the States at the time was a big hit. It was a kind of a ripoff of the British Ab Fab show. But Sybil Shepherd was a big TV and movie star. I was like, wow, if we could work on that show. So we write this spec script, a free script to show them what we can do. And by golly, we get an interview. They love our script. They bring us in for a meeting. And they tell us they shoot on Fridays. And they, shoot on, and they, and they rewrite all day on Saturdays. And I just say, oh, it's interesting. And uh, so they offer us the job. And my lawyer says, don't tell them about your whole crazy orthodox thing, OK? And uh, so I, I don't tell them. They give us the offer. And then we tell them I can't work Fridays and Saturdays. And the, they go through the roof. They feel that we've tried to trick them. And I say, look, 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 look. Tell those guys that if they don't want to hire us because of that, they'll never hear from me again except to thank you that you thought my work was good enough. That's it. There will be no, nothing but a thank you note once a year. To have you tell me that my writing is good enough to work on this show, that's why I came to town. Of course, I need the money desperately. So they say, you tell them. I'm like, what am I paying you 10% for? I got to go tell. So I call this producer. It's like Friday afternoon. My wife and I desperately need the money. We've been going through in vitro, and we've spent everything. And um, so it's like this would be a real job. And I tell the guy this thing. I look at, I, I'm sorry about the mix-up. This is lawyer's advice, and, uh, and I'll, you'll never hear anything from me again except thank you. Uh, please, I need this job. You know, if you don't want to hire us, I totally get it. But if you could see a way to hire He makes us wait until just before the sun goes down. My wife and I are looking at each other, and she says, mm, you know, just hang in there, honey. And I'm thinking, maybe we can start being observant next year, right? Why do we have to start now? It's sort of random anyway, isn't it? And we sit there and we wait and the phone rings and the producer says, all right, I asked the rest of the crew and you're hired. I'm going to work your tail. You're going to work 24-6. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you're going to work Christmas, Easter, and the Super Bowl. And my writing partner will be there on Fridays and Saturdays. And we get the job and I show up and... Um, there's a big German chef. They built this kitchen for the comedian Roseanne Barr. And now she's gone, but so this is Sybil's. So the crew from Seinfeld is coming in one door. The crew from Third Rock from the Sun comes in here. And the crew from Sybil comes in this way. And Gunther, the big German chef, oversees all of it. And he looks at me very early on. He says, why are you only eating my vegetables? You're not eating the chicken. And I said, well, I keep kosher. The one guy you don't want to make angry in Hollywood is the chef because the producer loves his chef, and this chef is a powerful fellow. And I'm embarrassed, and I'm thinking, I just got the job, and now I'm making a fuss. They're going to fire me. What? You, what you, you know, you're not eating my chicken? I keep kosher. Kosher? He screams it like for everybody. You're keeping kosher? You think that Gunther, the chef, can't cook for the little Jewish kosher man? I'm cooking here for the vegan and the vegetarian and the little nut man who can't look at a nut without his face blows up like a puffer fish. And you think I can't cook for the little Jewish kosher man. I go to the store. I get the empire kosher chicken. You eat this empire chicken? I check with my rabbi. Well, you have to double wrap it in foil and you got to bump it in the oven. It's just embarrassing. As get I just want to crawl under a rock. Fine, he says, I take the chicken, I put it in the foil, I wrap it with the butter, I put it in, I shove it in the oven. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I f cut to the end of the chase. This guy makes me a kosher chicken. And now I am the guy that wanted to put on a show in Roseanne Barr's custom-built million-dollar kitchen with this crew from Seinfeld, the crew from Third Rock the Sun, the Sybil crew, with a German chef cooking me a kosher Chicken, and I thought the baby with the teeth was cool. <laughs> and that was the end of eating Trafe out. Flash forward another 15 years, and I have two beautiful children in Jewish day schools. Thank you. <laughs> and a beautiful, sneeze, modest Jewish wife who has raised these beautiful children. And 
that her story is more amazing than my story. She's just, she's just more modest, so she doesn't tell it so loudly. And I sit with my kids on the bed at bedtime. My daughter won't let me sit there anymore. She's, she doesn't need to have dad around so much. She's busy with her friends, but beautiful Jewish friends. And my son will still let me uh, sit with him at bedtime, and we'll talk and tell jokes, and then we say Shema. And I hear these words, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. God is one. The difference between a zero being nothing and a zero being everything is when you take a whole bunch of zeros and you put a one in front of them, it starts to get good. We have the God of oneness, the God who allowed this crazy kid who has assimilated completely and would never dreamt of keeping kosher or keeping Shabbos. I, these are my favorite things now, are eating with my friends and my family and spending Shabbos all day with my friends and family. These are like the highlights of my week. I could never have done that except by taking one little tiny step at a time. If I'd have tried to do it all, I would have freaked out and jumped off a bridge. But if we take one little step every day, like Akiva talked about with a drop of water on the stone, we can do anything. We can all take one step. So I would just say to you today that if you're someone who, who doesn't think that this is a possible thing or doesn't even look good, look into it by taking one step. If you're doing a little bit of stuff, maybe you're not lighting a candle on Friday night, light a candle on Friday night. And then, and then if, you're lighting, if you're going to the movies on Friday night, light a candle and go to a better movie. <laughs> if you're learning uh, with, a, with a rabbi once a week, add one more day. Each of you knows in your heart that there's one more thing you can do to draw yourself closer to a relationship with eternity. And I would encourage you to take advantage of this incredible conference to make sure that this day you find that thing and take another step. Thank you very much for having me.